Now, we're going to be dealing, the climax of all history, of course, is the final week of Christ with a triumphal entry through the resurrection, which is obviously recorded in all four Gospels. But one of the issues that we immediately confront as we start talking about these uh, feasts and so forth, we discover by looking at the Bible carefully that almost everything we've been taught about the Easter week, as we might call it, is wrong. The church has for centuries assumed that the crucifixion took place on Friday. And there are many good scholars that still will defend that view. But is it Friday or Wednesday? Let's explore that a little bit. We know from John 12 that Jesus traveled from Jericho to Bethany six days before Passover. Well, that would require more than a Sabbath day's journey if Passover is on a Friday. I'll show you that in a minute in our chart. Jesus also specified there would be three days and three nights. Those are his words between the crucifixion and resurrection. You can't get three days and three nights between Friday and uh, Sunday. But there's another, there are three issues here. The other one is there are two Sabbaths between Passover and Sunday morning. I'll show you that too. So all three of these things put together suggest strongly that, it wa that he, Jesus could not have been crucified on a Friday. That's the point of it, of all this. And uh, in, in Matthew 28, verse 1, your, bi your English Bible says, when the Sabbath was passed. That's a mistranslation. If you look at the root text that many Bibles will be footnoted in, is the word of sabbaton, which means it's a plural noun that there are two Sabbaths, at least there's a plurality of Sabbaths between Passover and that Sunday morning. But uh, so the, see, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is one of the seven high Sabbaths each year, intervene between Passover and Shabbat. So let's take a look at this. This is a little sketch, if I may, of the 14th, the, the, the Passover, which is the feast, the one, first one we're going to tackle here, uh, is nailed to the calendar as being on the 14th of Nisan on the Jewish calendar. Now, if that's the case, then um, we know, let's take a look <clears throat> at the presumption that the 14th was a Friday. Well, then it, it, John 12, verse 1 says, Jesus, then Jesus, six days before Passover, came to Bethany. He's in Jericho getting to Bethany. And six days, that's about a 20-mile walk, by the way. But he's uh, he, from six days before Passover. Well, if, if that's true, six days before Passover... If Passover is on a Friday, then that would turn out that he did that journey on the 8th of Nisan, which is, would have been, a, on this reckoning, a Shabbat. Six days before Friday is a, is a Shabbat. Now, could a Orthodox Jew go more than a Sabbath day's journey on Shabbat? No. So all that tells you is that that particular year, that particular time, the 14th could not have been a Friday. Okay? It just doesn't work. You with me? Okay. So, the the eighth of Nisan that year could not have been a Shabbat. Something else uh, we have uh, uh, looking at this from another point of view. In Luke 19, we have recorded the triumphal entry. Jesus rides this, ranges this uh, uh, ride on his donkey, on a donkey, uh, from Bethany up over the Mount of Olives through the through uh, into Jerusalem. Very pivotal event in history because five centuries earlier, the angel Gabriel had told Daniel the very day that he was to do all that. So there's a big issue here that we'll try to skirt around right now for this review. In Luke 19, you'll find the triumphal entry mentioned. Now, turns out he did that on the 10th of Nisan. That was the same day that the Passover lambs are presented to the priests for inspection. The day that the, on the 10th of Nisan is when the Passover lambs that are going to be offered on the 14th, are inspected to make sure they are without blemish. Well, it turns out that if we're correct, that that's, that would be on a, you know, that the Passover actually took place on a Wednesday, that uh, 10 days earlier would have been the 10th of Nisan, and that's when the Passover lambs are offered inspection, and that's when our Passover was presenting himself for inspection, riding that donkey exactly the way Zechariah predicted in Zechariah chapter 9, riding into Jerusalem. And so, now, Passover, the, the lambs are examined on the 10th. They're offered between the evenings in Exodus 12.6. Exodus 12.6, in the Hebrew, it's between the evenings is the way it's expressed. We have all through the Old Testament that not a bone was to be broken. There are, there are dozens of specifications. You can hear a couple of these. Not a bone broken. Numbers twelve forty six. Uh, Exodus twelve forty six specifies it. Numbers nine repeats it again. It's even alluded to in the Psalms. 
And uh, Jesus, of course, is our Passover. When John the Baptist first introduces Jesus Christ publicly, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He introduces him with a Jewish title. He introduces him in his first public appearance uh, under John the Baptist that he's our Passover. And, uh, and, of course, in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Paul takes advantage of that, calls Jesus is indeed our Passover. Now, he was introduced as the Lamb, I say. The Old Testament details him as our Passover in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. Each one of those are worth a, a, a full hour's presentation if we had the time to go into the details. So he, he as I say, was inspected on the 10th of Nisan. He, is, he was found without blemish, Peter endorses in his, his uh, epistle. And again no, again, no bones broken all through the Scriptures. Pilate even echoes that, that um, appraisal when he says, I find no fault in him. Indeed, he was presented without blemish, without, without, without sin is the point. And uh, he tried very hard to uh, get off the hook. But in any case, uh, something else about that whole era is, occurs in Exodus chapter 6 where we're talking about the uh, Passover of, uh, of, um, that's forthcoming out of Egypt, where um, God says, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. The reason I'm pulling this out here, the Jews will highlight four major commands here. I will bring you out. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with stretched out arm, and I will take you to me for a people. From these four labels, they label the four cups of the Passover presentation, the cup of bringing out, the cup of the delivery, the cup of redemption, or the cup of blessing, as Paul calls it when he, he alludes to its institution in the Lord's Supper, and the fourth cup of taking out. I'm mentioning that there are so many details about the Passover that we don't have time to go. We're going to, get, we're going to have a subsequent session that will, Dan Stolbarger will take you through the Passover much more deeply than we have time for here. But uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, um, we, we have this third cup is the cup with which the Lord uh, institutes the, the Last Supper, the Last Seder, I should say. And uh, the, uh, it's interesting that that fourth cup was incomplete, that he takes a Nazarite vow. The Lord says, I will not touch the fruit of the vine until we all are together in the, in the kingdom. Leaven is very prominent in all the... Um, Levitical observations, except one, and I'll come to that. Leaven is a type of sin in the Old and New Testament both. It's a very interesting idiom used that way because it corrupts by puffing up. And it's a very, very uh, colorful metaphor, if you will. And uh, all through the Old Testament, that term is used that way. All through the New Testament, it's used that way. It's a, it's a very consistently used idiom where leaven refers that which is uh, sin or hypocrisy or, or deceit is, is always is leaven. It's interesting that the woman in the leaven, in Matthew 13, the, the fourth of the kingdom parables, um, you won't understand that unless you understand that leaven is sin and that, you, uh, that the, the whole um, point of that parable hangs on understanding the role of, that, of the leaven there. In second in uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, Jesus was made sin for us, and uh, again we have uh, the, the, his role as a, uh, in our place. In contrast to the leaven, of course, Jesus himself. It's one of his seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. It says, "I am the bread of life." In contrast to the in, in the contrast to the leaven, Passover is so essential for Christians to understand. That that's why we're devoting a whole separate session just on the Passover itself. We're just hitting a few highlights here. But I do want to cover the, the, this uh, three days and three nights issue. If Passover is on the 14th, Jesus himself said that he would, be in the, he would be in the grave three days and three nights. 
Well, if he, if he is executed on Passover between the evenings, Passover starts at sunset before sunset the following day from our point of view uh, uh, is still the 14th of Nisan. If he's in the grave three days and three nights, that means the resurrection would occur at sundown Saturday night. In other words, the first part of the, uh, of the uh, you know, the following day. So, now, we also know that the women came to the tomb after the end of the Sabbaths. That's in Matthew 28, verse 1. Why, what, the Sabbaths is plural. The day after Passover is, starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is one of the three obligatory feasts that every able-bodied Jew had to attend. After the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we have Sabbath. See, Passover could be any day of the week depending on what year it was because it would shift because of the shift of the calendars. But whatever it is, it, uh, there's, a Passover, there's a Sabbath after Passover the next morning is the feast of unleavened is the feast of first fruits. It's defined that way. So on this particular time, the fourteenth of Nisan is on a Wednesday. That made the morning after Shabbat after Passover. That's it's always on a Sunday morning, but that Sunday morning would be three days and three nights from the Wednesday. Follow me. It all fits. It wouldn't fit any year. It fits this year, and uh, so. So we have here in view Passover itself, another major bread, and a, a, a which is a Shabbaton. It's a, a, in addition to the fifty-two Sabbaths each year, they have seven high Sabbaths, and Feast of Unleavened Bread is one of those. The Feast of First Fruits, the, the first of the harvest celebration. That Sunday morning, when the smoke at the temple was going up from the formal Feast of first fruits. there were a group of women heading for an empty tomb. Deuteronomy points out that there are three of the seven that are required attendance. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. <laughs> The Feast of First Fruits, that's the one, right? That's the one we're dealing with here. In Leviticus 23, verse 11, for the, the morrow after sh the Sabbath after Passover. So you've got Passover on the 14th. There's a Sabbath after that, a Shabbat, that's like a Saturday. And it's the morning after. In other words, all, first, the Feast of First Fruits will always be thus on a, what we would call a Sunday. The morning of the ultimate first fruits, of course, is when Jesus Christ himself became our first fruits. Okay? So not only is the first fruits predictive of Christ, his fulfillment of that was on that day. So notice there's two so far. Passover, it's, he was our Passover, and he was crucified when the lamb was slain, i.e. on Passover. He is also, the first fruits predicts his resurrection. He is resurrected on the day that it is celebrated. So not only are these, not only are these feasts predictive, they're fulfilled on the day that they're observed, okay? Now, let me show you how precise this is. Let me ask a question. When did the flood of Noah end? In chapter 6 we have of Genesis, we have the setup of all of this. Chapter 7, we have uh, the, the flood beginning. Chapter 8, verse 4, is where the flood ends. Let's take a look at that. Chapter... The ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. In chapter 6 and 7, we've had the whole story of Noah's flood. I assume you're familiar with that. But whenever you, if you're a normal Bible reader and you come across a verse like this, the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat, you, you, you go ahead and you keep reading. If you've been to one of my Bible studies, you are no longer a normal, well-adjusted person. You'll recall that I gave you this teaser saying that there's no irrelevant detail in the Scripture. Every detail there is deliberately there by design. Whenever you find, the rabbis will tell you, whenever you find a story that seems to have some unnecessary detail in it, that's called a remez. 
That's a sign that says, dig here, dig deeper, dig here. It's a hint of something deeper. Well, this is one of those. The ark rested in the seventh month. The seventh. Why did the Holy Spirit want you to know that the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of that month? Now, this one takes a little digging. That's why I wanted to amplify it here. There's, there's hundreds of details on all these things. We can't go through all of them. We'll just hit some of the highlights. But this one takes a little explanation, so I thought we'd get into it. You need to understand that the Jews have two calendars, not just one. The calendar in Genesis is the calendar that starts that the Jewish New Year is in the fall, Rosh Hashanah, head of the year. And uh, so that's in the, it's the first of Tishri. That's a fall month. Rosh Hashanah is in the fall. The Passover month is in the sun in the spring. If you think of Rosh Hashanah as roughly September, typically on our calendar, they shift, of course. Um, think of Nisan as being March, April. Well, in Exodus chapter 12, where God is telling Moses about getting ready for the, uh, chapter 12 in Exodus where the Passover takes place in Egypt, where they're going to put the blood on the doorposts and all of that. Verse 2 of chapter 12, God says to Moses, this month, the month of Nisan, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Well, that's a little awkward because they're used to dealing with first of Tishri is the new year, but now they're in spring. And God's saying, no, I want you to make this the first year of your, uh, first month of your year. So if you look at the Genesis calendar, the first month would be Tishri in the fall. You go through the different 12 months and they wrap around again. But by following the Exodus account, we've got to redesignate Nisan as the first month, not the seventh, but the first, and wrap it around. So you really have two calendars. The civil calendar, the secular calendar from their point of view, would be the Genesis calendar. And they celebrate that this way to, uh, that way to this day. In the fall, they, at Rosh Hashanah, they will celebrate the new year. Whether you're religious or not, that's the civil new year. The religious year would be the, the first of the religious year is at Pas the month of Passover, which is Nisan. Two calendars. All right. So Tishri is the first month of the secular year. It's the seventh month of the religious year. Nisan is the uh, first month of the religious year, but it's the seventh month on the Genesis calendar. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, let's talk about the Feast of First, of, feast of first Fruits again. Crucifixion took place on what day of the month? Anyone? 14th, huh? 14th of Nisan. How long was he in the tomb? Three days. Good guess. Okay. So that means he, he gets resurrected on the 17th of Nisan, right? Except, although Nisan's the first month of the religious calendar, it's the seventh month of the Genesis calendar, right? What does that mean? Genesis 8.4 says that the new beginning on the planet Earth occurred on the 17th day of the seventh month. When the ark came to rest, that starts the whole new era, right? On the anniversary in advance of our new beginning in Christ. Do you see the two count do you see the events link? How the, the the resurrection of Jesus Christ is on the anniversary of the new life given by the whole episode of, of Noah and the eight people aboard that ark. Okay. Our new beginning on planet Earth was on the anniversary in advance, putting it that way, of our new beginning in Christ. You can look at it from either point of view, same anniversary. I think that's kind of interesting. So the final week of Christ, he, Friday he's at Bethany, goes to, he, he, we talked about that. By Saturday he does his triumph. By the way, the triumphal entry was not on a Sunday. It was big, Palm Sunday. Sorry, it was Shabbat. <laughs> Small point, but again, almost everything that has come out of tradition turns out to be wrong. Not just, in the Hebrew, not just on the Jewish side, Jewish traditions, the traditions that aren't in the text are often wrong. Well, in the church too, things that are not documented in the Bible typically are not only unreliable, they're typically wrong. Sunday, the fig tree is cursed. Monday, the conspirators council. These are, these are conjectures trying to feast together the different, uh, the, you know, uh, different, different scholars have a slightly different perception here. Tuesday would be the last supper between the evenings, according to this reckoning, the crucifixion on a Wednesday using their count, accountant. Uh, Thursday, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Women prepare the, uh, the 
spices. Saturday they rested. After the Sabbaths have passed, we have he has risen. That's one reckoning, and there are all kinds of technical disputes on some of them. I want to touch base on something else because I think it's illuminating in many ways. There's a fancy word you can look up in any encyclopedia called the quarto decimanism. It's a viewpoint. It, uh, it, uh, in, in, the, in, in the early church's zeal to separate from Jewishness, these quarto decimans were a point of great discussion. Now, what does quarto deciman mean? It's a Latin way of saying 14s. Quarto deciman is 14. It, the term was used to identify those that practiced their celebration of Passover for Christians on the 14th day of Nisan, as per the Old Testament calendar. In other words, there were Christians in those early centuries that tried very hard to um, celebrate the Lord's resurrection in accordance with a with in connection with the Jewish Passover, the 14th, 14th of Nisan. So they would look at the 14th of Nisan and, and practice accordingly. This was the original method of fixing the day of Passover, which is to be, according to the book of Exodus, a perpetual ordinance. Nothing ever changed the Bible's view of Passover. It was that way. There have been some rabbinical debates about some subtle details, but basically it has always been the 14th Nisan, and the earliest church practiced that in, in honor of Christ's, Christ being our Passover. Makes sense, doesn't it? In the second century, you find there's all kinds of tensions brewing over this issue. In 115 and 125 A.D., the Roman church made a Passover on a Sunday, on a Sunday at least since the time of Bishop uh, uh, Exodus or Sextus, and Eusebius records that. Uh, in 154 A.D., Polycarp visits Rome to discuss the difference between the Pascal or Passover calculation with uh, Bishop Anesetis and uh, reached an amical compromise. He, he was able to, there's a tension going on, and they're, find, they're trying to find a compromise. What's going on here? Eusebius also writes that Polycrates of, uh, of uh, Ephesus and Irenaeus wrote in support of the Quarto Decimus. Certain church fathers were saying that these 14 guys had it right, but they are not being accepted by the leadership. There's a big tension brewing here, and it gets worse until you get to the Council of Nicaea. We all know about the Council of Nicaea because of certain other debates, but there's something about the Council of Nicaea that I had missed until um, I was pointed to this. You could do a little research here. During the council, this is now the third, this is 325 A.D. This is the, the Constantine, the emperor of the world, is chairing this conference. The council unanimously ruled that the Easter, they're using the term Easter here to w describe what we would call the Passover season. And the Easter is actually a pagan label, but we're not using it as a pagan label here. We're using it the way most people use it today, referring to what the Jews would call Passover that the Easter festival should be celebrated throughout the Christian world on the first Sunday after the full moon following the vernal equinox. After that, if the full moon should occur on a Sunday and thereby coincide with the Passover festival, Easter should be commemorated the following Sunday. You understand what they're trying to do? They're trying to not only follow the Old Testament, they want to, if it accidentally falls that way, they want to shift it. Why, what's going on here? As a result of the Council of Nicaea and amended by numerous subsequent meetings, the formal church deliberately attempted to design a formula for Easter which would avoid any possibility of falling on the Jewish Passover even accidentally. Does that strike you as a little strange? The quattro decimans were then excommunicated. Those that were trying to follow the Scripture were, kicked, were excommunicated, which was heavy stuff in those days. If you read Eusebius in his, life, in his work on the life of Constantine, quote, it appeared an unworthy thing that in the celebration of this most holy feast we should follow the practice of the Jews who have impiously defiled their hands with enormous sin and are therefore deservedly afflicted with blindness of soul. Let us then have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd for we have received, that, for we have received from our Savior a different way. See, the church is trying to blame the crucifixion of Christ on the Jews. His blood be on us and our children. It's the anti-Semitism that's driving this here. Now, I think we all know that the guy responsible for the death of Christ is me. And my sins put him on that cross. But this is the, it's, it, I think it's useful for us to understand the mood of the times there. 
In the epistle of Emperor Constantine himself, as recorded in uh, Theodoret's uh, ecclesiastical history, it says, quote, it was in the first place declared improper to follow the custom of the Jews in the celebration of this holy festival because their hands having been disdained with crime, the minds of these wretched men are necessarily blinded. Let us then have nothing in common with the Jews who are our adversaries, avoiding all contact in the evil way. This is astonishing. It continues. Who have... Ha <clears throat> After having uh, compassed the death of our Lord, being out of their minds, are guided not by sound reason, but by an unrestrained passion, wherever their innate madness carries them, a people so utterly depraved. Therefore, this irregularity must be corrected in order that we may no more have anything in common with those parasites and murderers of our Lord, no single point in common with the perjury of the Jews. A shocking language. It's important for us to understand how virulent the attitudes were in the early church. Say, would you want to return to the early church? I don't think so. This is third. This is this is not medieval. This is third century. This isn't Vatican yet. This is Constantine, then Byzantium. Okay, and uh, so it's not surprising then that confusion reigns. It, it gets worse. See, they were using the Julian calendar, which had an eleven-day problem that they later discovered. Greg, Pope, Pope Gregory corrects it. The Julian calendar was involved in an astronomical problem, the discrepancy between the solar year and the lunar year. And all kinds of alternatives for changing the date were tried by the church, but proved unsatisfactory. So Easter was celebrated in different dates by different churches in different parts of the world. It got worse and worse. In 387, for example, the dates of Easter in France and Egypt were 35 days apart. So there's, you know, there's, the whole church is struggling here. See, the Jewish, bear in mind, the Jewish day starts at sunset. The lunar calendar, and they're on a lunar calendar, which are three and a half days shorter than our calendar, and they solved that in a very strange way. All calendars change in 701 B.C. There's, uh, re, there's scientific speculation that it had to do with the Mars near past by, and we go through all of that in our Joshua commentary. I won't go into it here, but they all changed about 701 B.C. In most cultures, all, virtually all the ancient cultures, 14 of them, had 360-day calendars, 12 months of 30 days each. And none of them were quite right. In 701, and they worked fine for centuries until 701, suddenly they all have to change them. Most of them add uh, uh, five and a four and a quarter days to adjust it. The Jews, just, Hezekiah did something different. They argue, uh, uh, they all argue why he did it. I mean, they all argue the different things he did, but they don't, no one documents why did he have to change it at all. And that's why we, there's evidence of, a, of an actual change in the orbit. But anyway, the way the Jews, we, we add one day every four years, and then every 25,000 years is another correction. But the point is, the Jews add a month on a very, uh, uh, on a, uh, they add leap year. They take a leap year and just add a month and a leap year, made a 13-month thing. They do that in the 3rd, 6th, 11th, 14th, 17th, 19th month. By going through that procedure, they get back to sidereal proximity, the lunar year and the sidereal year being uh, separate by 11 and a half days. So, the Jewish calendar has got its own problems. That's the way they solved it there. That's what makes the, the difference so strange. About 465, the church adopted a system of calculation proposed by another astronomer to reform the calendar and fix the date of Easter. And some of, this, some of these uh, methods are still in use um, through the 6th century. Um, the British and the Celtic Christian churches, um, you know, uh, declined to accept these changes until the big disputes going on through those centuries, out through the 7th century. And then we finally get to 1582 when Pope Gregory revised the Julian calendar to be what we call the Gregorian calendar. And by adopting that, he eliminated some of the difficulties in fixing the date of Easter and arranging some kind of order to all this. And it wasn't until 1752, you know, virtually almost two centuries it took for the British Empire and Ireland to join in to accept the Gregorian calendar. But uh, that would th that brings some uh, thing in here. But uh, the Eastern ch churches didn't accept the Gregorian calendar, and uh, so they, they still stayed differently. And occasionally, those dates would coincide. In 1865 and 1963, they happened to be in step together. In 1928, that's recently, the British Parliament enacted a measure allowing the Church of England to commemorate Easter on the first Sunday after the second Saturday in April. They finally adopted a, a formula. But despite all this churning around, they're still, Easter is looked at as a movable feast because these contrived procedures 
deliberately try to disconnect it from the Bible. Those that stayed with the Bible were excommunicated. And uh, strange, strange stuff. So we, we've talked about the spring feasts, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. They collectively are called uh, Passover as a season because they're all within a few days of each other. So it's a Passover season, but they're three distinct feasts. Passover on the 14th of Nisan, the Feast of Unleavened Bread the next day and starts, goes for seven days actually, and the Feast of First Fruits, which is the Sunday after Shabbat, after Passover. And this is one of those strange places where uh, that the... Uh, the um, uh, Sag- the uh, Samaritans have it correct. Strange, the Samaritans and the Jews have slightly different traditions, and there's big debates between the Pharisees and the Samaritans. And it turns out the, Phar- the, the this is one of those strange places where I, I, I think they're the ones that have it correct. But the there are three more feasts that are in the fall, all fall in the same month. This is interesting. Keep in mind, the three spring feasts are in the month of Nisan. The three fall feasts are also in one month, in the month of Tishri. The three feasts are the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll take a quick look at these.